getting everything set up as you guys come in here. I'm really excited to host these free monthly workshops for you guys. Um, whether you are a member or not, I just wanted to be able to have a space that was outside of social media that we can connect and have some time together and just get to know everyone better as we go through the season of gardening and 2023 together. So I am, I've been wanting to do this for a while and it feels really good. So I think we have, I roughly saw about 15 to 20 people. We'll see if they all come today. I know this is a weird time, but it's the best time with my schedule. That's why I do recording. So that if you did sign up and you couldn't be here for the live session or you have to skip out quickly because you're at work or a meeting comes up, no worries. Uh, you will be receiving an email that has the recording so you can access it for up to a month afterwards. Our members receive it indefinitely, but they also have their own sessions that are going on this month so that they have access to. I have the chat open and it is the best spot if you're attending to drop in some questions and I think we'll just get started here in just a second so that but go ahead and introduce yourself drop anything into the chat as you feel I am somebody when I do zooms when I am not leading them that is the quiet lurker and doesn't have my video or anything on so no pressure to turn it on, especially midday if you are working or whatever. So these sessions are not as much about the interaction. Our community ones are more about community-centered interaction, and these ones are more of like a quick teaching session so that you guys walk away with a tidbit of great information that is helpful, but it isn't... Um, something where we all have to interact and that's why they're only 30 minutes so but many of you know who I am but I'm Megan Gilger so <laughs> if this is your first time coming to one of these uh, I run the Fresh Exchange which is an online community and a gardening website so we help you guys grow through the seasons and grow with yourself so through your gardens and nature but okay so we're just going to jump in. Some people are just going to be filtering in. That's my assumption. So uh, that's usually how it works. So I just want to encourage you guys, once again, some of you have already been here and heard this, but drop things into the chat. I will give you some moments where I'm going to be looking for you guys to drop things into chat. Uh, personally, I want you guys to just share something about yourself. Like, are you a beginner? What? Where are you at with your gardening journey? Where do you live? Anything like that. Just to give us any idea of who you are. Some more people are coming in. So as you connect your audio, just go ahead and drop those things into the chat. Uh, and you can just say, once again, something about yourself and your gardening experience. Uh, I'm assuming since this is a beginner focused class, many of you are beginners. But if you're not, that's also okay. Or maybe this is your second or third garden. Doesn't matter. It's I still sometimes consider myself a beginner at different stages of what I'm doing as a gardener. So if it's a new project, I still consider myself a beginner because I'm learning through it. And that is what I love about the community is I myself get to learn from other people in our community as well, which is really exciting. So everybody has something different to bring to the table. So in this session, I am going to basically give you today like my biggest tip for beginners and um, oh, Felicity, you're moved from to Michigan after a decade in Texas. My husband's from Texas, so uh, that's really exciting. Uh, it's very different. <laughs> so uh, Lisa's from Grand Rapids, welcome. Your grandma has a big garden. Oh, I love that. I learned from my grandfather. Uh, Lindsay, you're in upstate New York. Oh, we have a couple of members that are in upstate New York. Uh, it's great and so beautiful. Uh, one of our members, she lives in the Catskills, and she had a bear in her garden this last year. <laughs> it was absolutely fascinating to see her videos. <laughs> we all laughed about it, and he was a regular visitor and liked her beans or something, if I remember right. So that was all he did. He would just come and, like, pick the beans. It was very funny. <laughs> uh, so upstate New York is definitely very interesting. And then, Michaela, you are from central Indiana. Wonderful place. Second year with raised beds, yes. Um, 
and awesome you guys this is so exciting just even though there's only a few of us like I said this is recorded so many people I think signed up with the intention that they're gonna come and watch it later which is totally fine I do that all the time personally for other zooms so I wanted to share the, be the biggest tip and this is something that I've learned over the years not just as a beginner but also working with other beginners uh, whether it's I'm designing their first garden for them or they've moved into a new space and I'm helping them uh, create a new garden and just what has been the best way to approach it but also the best way to feel success because it's not always about when you're moving whether it's a new space or it's your first garden or your second garden with you know you know a second year with raised beds or something like that there's so much information like it can feel incredibly overwhelming and in that's what i find the most especially with our members and people like that they come in and they're feeling very overwhelmed and i don't ever want people to feel like they are so overwhelmed that they cannot start a garden and instead I want to really simplify it and it's why I created the beginner garden course because I wanted it to I wanted you guys to just have something that was easily accessible and I walked you through the process of being a beginner but also gave you a design that like took the whole guesswork out of the whole thing because and it's companion planted it's everything that I teach but you're given the roadmap and so you don't you can learn but you're also given everything you need <laughs> at the same time. Uh, I wanted to make it that easy, but even if we are taking something that gives us a roadmap, there are still challenges and bumps along the way. And what I te try to remind people of is that the biggest, most important thing to understand is that to, you need to begin with a long-term plan, but you need to start small. Let me explain that and break that down. So beginning with this, a long-term plan means, for instance, we'll just take my garden. You know, I had an acre area that I planned to develop over the course of five years time. We started with 12 raised beds, which is a lot. That is more than I would ever recommend to the normal person, but I was seasoned enough that 12 raised beds was perfectly fine for me to manage and understand how to do. But I always suggest to most beginners to start even with an herb garden and we have in the community, there is a free course that you can take as a non member to learn how to actually create your own herb garden in a way that's also transitional so it's a low cost in and everything so you can experience what it is to grow a garden to get the understanding of what it is to layer soil in a bed, what it is to grow a plant and maintain them how to harvest from it all these like simple aspects because even though we have these big dreams and those dreams are going to happen we have to start from the ground up and the best way to do that is to start small so all those big ideas you have maybe for a new space or where are you going to want to be in five years in your life you know we don't tackle those dreams right away we don't do them in this way where it's like Oh, I want to get a promotion in my job, so I'm just going to go after it right now. We know that it takes little steps along the way to go this way or that way to get where we want to in our career. So why wouldn't we approach our gardens the same way? And that's why I say have a big plan, have this dream, because I have this dream of like this huge orchard and like all this raspberry patches and things like that. They don't exist right now. They're still in process and they're taking time and every year I plug away a little bit more on it and I understand a little more about what it is to do that thing. And I become a little bit more in tune with what it is to prune trees properly or things like that, for instance, and, and learn what it is to grow trees on my own property. But what starting small allows us to do is really understand the plants that we're growing, which makes us feel connected to nature in a more realistic and grounded way and you feel like you have the space so instead of trying to manage like 40 plants because they're all different and it's like having 40 friends and you can't all hang out at the same time because and you want to give each of them the right attention that they need because they each need unique attention but if we instead only have five plants or in this analogy five friends that we really want to give ourselves to 
we can really get to know them in an intimate way so that as we expand, we don't feel like we're always relearning this experience. We already understand this experience. Now we can build a little more, add another five plants. And eventually before you know it, in five years time, you're gonna be at a place that, you know, you've got a whole host of information in your mind and you have built that larger vision that you have. And so, I just, oh, I think we just get so excited when we see those seed catalogs and I see so many beginners just get so into the idea of this grander vision and I don't want to downplay the grander vision because it is really important. But I always suggest having this five year plan, having a 10 year plan, you know, depending on your stage of life and then starting really small, such as with something like an herb garden, for instance, because you're going to feel so much more success you are going to feel like you actually have the tools that you need in order to continue growing. And that's why I'm so big into this very simple idea. And I know it sounds so small, but to, to say that, but I can't tell you in our community how many people this last year came back and they said, I, when I asked, you know, what are some of the things that you guys struggled with this year? And everybody came back and said, I did too much. It was too much for me to handle. I felt overwhelmed. I felt, you know, all these things. And so we all discussed how much it, how it's really nice to stay small sometimes and that there's nothing wrong with setting, settling into that feeling of small, smaller is better. So I don't want to at all discourage that grander vision, but I really, 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 really want to say starting small is great. Having five plants in five pots is great. You know, if that's what you can do this year and then you are doing the best thing for yourself, which is the most important thing, which is gonna keep you on your gardening journey and continuing you to explore and remain curious and to also feel success and ha as if you have space to learn from things that maybe don't go as well, because something is bound to happen that is not going to go as anticipated. But when you have a lot of things that you can't keep up with that don't go as anticipated, it can feel debilitating and sort of like, oh my gosh, I'm bad at this, when you really aren't. And it's harder to see those successes and the moments where it's like, yeah, this year I learned how to layer soil properly to feed, you know, my plants. And I learned what the importance of mycelium in my soil means and what it looks like. I learned those things. Yay, that's amazing. Because those are key parts of understanding the greater network of what it is to garden and to grow plants. And even if we don't see maybe the largest harvest or something like that, it's no different in life. So I hope that this is helpful and I want to leave space here now. There's some people that have come in and out. Um, if you just came in, I think there's two. Oh, Natalie, who's a member of our online community and um, Felicity, then if you if you guys just want to drop in information about yourself so we can learn a little about you, uh, you can see other people's responses, I believe. Uh, maybe I can't always remember how Zoom does it. But uh, if you guys have questions about this specific idea or just beginner, you're a beginner and you just want to ask a question, I want to leave like 10 minutes here at the end to just have you guys drop in some questions and I'm happy to answer them. And I want you guys to walk away feeling like you have something to work with. <laughs> yes, Natalie, quality over quantity. <laughs> Which we're doing a full... Um, garden planning intensive in the community where we're doing it as a community helping each other design our gardens and our main theme is less is more this year so we're all helping each other make the most out of the spaces that maybe we already have so we can learn together that way so if you guys have questions go ahead and drop them in or feel free to turn on your mic and ask them in person whatever you feel most comfortable with um i am more than happy to answer And these can be any questions about beginning your garden at all. It does not have to be about this specific 
response and idea that I gave. So if you have a question about your garden, it can be anything. I'm totally cool with that. <laughs> Soil preparation, that is a great question. Um, Soil preparation in terms of how do you care for existing soil or putting into raised beds? I just want to make sure I'm asking your question specifically, answering it specifically. Raised beds. Okay, so if you are putting in new raised beds this year and um, you are going to be just filling them, I enter the Ginner Gardener course, which you can there's i'm gonna in the email that you guys will get after this you're gonna get the opportunity to just try out one month free in our online community if you want to so i didn't promote that when i was talking about it on instagram but i want you guys to just kind of check out what the course is um and everything so you guys will get access to that if you would like to but um anyways there is a whole section on how to actually layer it but Basically what you do is you have you want to put in a layer of cardboard underneath and what the, and you don't want any printing on the cardboard. You simply just want it to be blank or with plant based inks on it. And what the cardboard does is you don't actually have to kill the grass or remove the grass or anything underneath. You literally can just like sink your raised bed in, put the cardboard on the cardboard is going to suppress the growth of the weeds so they will not be coming up through and um, you don't have to redo this every year one time is enough to suppress it with everything else that's on top and then you just are going to lay the cardboard then you're going to lay like you know an inch or inch and a half to two inches of hardwood mulch and i specifically suggest hardwood mulch which is like pine chips or any of that i know it's really popular on instagram to see people putting in logs and sticks and that's a whole nother form of like a german form of doing rice beds which is awesome but particularly I'm seeing a lot of you like where you're coming from and we get a lot of moisture and those those are not going to degrade properly there's a lot of reasons I wouldn't necessarily suggest that model because it does come out of Germany which is a very different type of environment in terms of their winters and weather so I maybe Indiana I think one of you is from Indiana so maybe that would be okay there but I would suggest mulch because it's not going to retain the moisture in the same way and it's going to degrade really well. The mulch offers the opportunity to create mycelium, which is this really amazing white stuff that you may have seen in mulch beds before. And it looks like mold, but actually, um, okay, Utah for the raised bed. So a little drier and environment wise. And so you could use logs or sticks, but I still would lean towards the sticks or mulch um, over logs. So filling them, they're a great way to fill without cost. And <laughs> it, they're just great, I think. Um, and it, mimics the natural like environment that most plants would grow in anyways like in the woods so you're going to put that down and you'll just need you know not that much space and it also you can grade this depending on how deep your raised beds are if your raised beds are eight inches or 12 inches or 24 inches you can kind of change the proportions a little bit and then after that you're going to use quite a bit of topsoil like i suggest a good half of the beds just being topsoil and why topsoil Topsoil is the, think about it as like the general makeup of what makes soil. It is the base of the soil. And so you can get screened topsoil anywhere and it's usually pretty cheap. Uh, you just want to make sure it's well screened and then you, or you can pull it out of your yard if you have a spot and then you just fill the beds with that. And then you put on two to four inches of really high grade nutrient dense compost. This can be any type of compost from compost to common manure to mushroom compost to just a general veggie um, compost mix. Make sure it's organic, you know, screen comes from a reputable source. Um, local sources are usually the best from my experience. Uh, the more local, the better. There's usually somebody making compost that you can find in, within an hour of where you live. It's pretty normal these days and it's better than getting it shipped and less likely to contain things that aren't as sustainable for the environment, such as peat, moss, and things like that. So if you can source that locally, usually you're not gonna find those ingredients in there. So that's the best way to do it, and also the most cost-effective. And if you're worried about cost with raised bed 
soil going in there, then I would definitely say like shorter raised beds. Like my raised beds are only eight inches deep and it's totally fine. The roots still reach down into the normal ground, but there's a lot less to fill. And I still can keep a high level of nutrient density going in there every single season. You don't have to have really high beds unless you want that for your own physical need. Like we have children, so it's easier to have raised beds that are lower to the ground. But if you maybe are retired or um, older, maybe you want raised beds that are taller, you can also get them lifted up um, and off the ground, like with stands and things like that that are really cool. Gardeners has some if you want to invest in those. So, uh, okay, there was a couple things came in. Uh, Sherry, you also said, where do you get pine chips? So pine chips, you can get at any landscaping spot. Um, most garden like nurseries have them in bulk. And so you can bring like five gallon buckets or you can, if you have a truck or a trailer, you can put them in there. Or sometimes they just deliver them to your house and you just put a tarp out and they'll dump them onto your tarp. You usually pay a delivery fee if you do it that way, depending on how many raised beds you're filling. Tell them the size of your raised beds and how deep you want it, and they'll usually give you a great dimension of how much you actually need. So pine is always cheaper. Cedar is really great from a pest perspective. Um, pests do not like cedar uh, chips and or mulch, so they will actually avoid it. Particularly if you have tick issues or anything like that in your yard, um, if you're going to be using it with your landscaping, cedar is definitely worth the investment for that reason. Uh, okay. Felicity, you ask, I'm spending some time this month learning about good and bad bugs. Gardening in Michigan is new to me. Yep. It, there's a lot of new things about every place that we live. What pests do you deal with most here? Also, thanks for the blog post about keeping deer out of the garden. Yes, I'm glad that was helpful. Um, so, pests. So, a lot of the pests in Grand Rapids, what I find a lot of people, if you said you were in Grand Rapids, am I correct, Felicity? Remind me. Or are you in Northern Michigan? Where are you at? East Lansing. Okay. So you're going to have a few more different pests than we will have, but here in the north, just because of our climate is slightly different. Uh, predominantly, you're going to be dealing with squash bugs, tomotillo bugs, if you grow tomotillos, um, Colorado potato beetles, Japanese beetles, um, I'm trying to think, hornworms, tomato hornworms, and, and then you're definitely, there's going to, you'll see ants aphids, things like that. Very normal. Uh, what I would, this is why I lean into companion planting is I find, oh, and I think I mentioned about squash bugs. All these things can be prevented pretty easily naturally through hand removal, uh, regularly checking your plants, but ones like hornworms and a large amount of aphids, things like that, and Japanese beetles. Japanese beetles, for the most part, have a very quick season. They look like they're ruining your plants, but if you have healthy plants that are well fed and they have plenty of roots and they're really happy and uh, they're going to be fine, they will just go on and be like, okay, cool, I'm just going to keep. So don't get too stressed about Japanese beetles. They usually move past and they're not too bad most years. Uh, the one, if you have a lot of aphids, you're going to want to attract ladybugs, which comes from bringing in a lot of flowers and native plants that they love. You will see caterpillars such as swallowtail caterpillars come onto your carrots and dill and things like that, and they're not going to be harmful. Uh, they look like they are, but they are not, so don't worry about them. I highly suggest not getting into neem oil or BT or any of that. For the most part, our gardens, particularly in, north of the Mich or in Michigan, central and northern, you can usually they're all seasonal. They go through a period of time that they're there and then they move on. And if we provide enough flowers and other things around, there are beneficial bugs that come in and actually want those bad bugs and they will eat them. So I have a couple of reels on Instagram where I actually show an ecosystem existing and happening, like where ladybugs have laid their larvae and their larvae are actually eating the aphids that are covering a whole plant. And that plant never saw any problems because it, it was totally fine and it was because the ecosystem worked itself out and so many times when we just you know put in the right things companion planting is what i use in particular it it finds a way to just do its thing and it's really beautiful to watch and have patience with 
So, um, like I said, in the beginner gardener course specifically, I like detail out like an exact garden design that does this and has worked in other people's gardens, particularly here in Michigan. So it's really great. Uh, and then Natalie, you gave a great um, suggestion about how to locate uh, pine chips. And she said, I live in a smaller town and I found a man that clears trails. He gave me four big bags full of chips. I found talking to everyone about what I'm doing really opens opportunities for freebies. And this is such a great tip. Thank you, Natalie. That was perfect because it's really true. So <laughs> you, it, gardening has a beautiful way of connecting people like for instance, I have a friend who has llamas. She gives me her llama poop and I put it in my flower beds and free fertilizer and she needs to get rid of it. And we're friends because of that very weird connection about poop, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> it's really cool how you meet awesome people that way. And they usually also have incredible information about gardening specific to your area. It's really fun. So it's a great way to connect and find community. So Felicity, that may be a great way to also learn a little more about some of the bugs that you may see specifically in your neighborhood. So it sounds funny, but they can be that minuscule in terms of ecosystem. So I think that can be really helpful. So get talking with some local people around you is really fun. So I hope this is helpful. Does anyone have any more questions before we tie up today? Okay, Michaela, you said, do raised beds need to be covered over winter to protect, to preserve the soil? If so, what do you recommend? Um, so all I do in the fall, and there, there's actually a course available right now in the community that was our first course that we released last year, and it was about winter prep. And all you have to do is put a mulching down. Now, when I say mulch, mulch does not always mean like wood chips. You can actually use hay or straw, depending on what you have available. Um, straw is a little better because it's less likely to reseed, but use what you got. Um, leaves can also work. Don't use pine needles, too much acid, uh, but you can use leaves. Just watch yourself for ticks if you live in an area with ticks um, after you handle them. Or just by laying a really nice thick layer of new compost raked in on top of your raised beds, that also acts as its own mulch. So for instance, we have chickens and I just take their bedding and their pine wood chips and everything and I pull them out and it has all their poop in it and I lay it out with some fresh straw over the top of our raised or all our in-ground beds and our raised beds I just put fresh compost on and it works every single year everything's ready to go in the spring and I do do a fertilizing after I plant everything but I don't do anything else in the spring um, unless I just missed that season of laying fresh compost or I just want it on there. <laughs> Sometimes I just do it for fun. Why not? <laughs> so, um, but that's all you have to do to maintain the nutrients and the health of your soil and protect it. Because what you're doing is you're protecting the top soil and then you're putting a mulching over the top and that is what feeds down and then all winter that feeds nutrients into the soil below. Okay, last question from Sherry. You are so welcome, Michaela. Um, I need help with starting berries and with starting chickens, chicken coop. Would your membership cover that? Absolutely. We're, I am actually getting my new set of chickens and I, this spring, if that's going to be possible, we'll see. <laughs> um, and I am adding in a new set of hens this year. So I am going to be sharing that whole experience with our community and we have a whole section of other chicken owners. We have quite a few different chicken owners that have gone through the experience in the last two years and or are doing it this year um, in the community already. And so there's lots of information there. Um, I don't have a specific course on berries and chickens yet, but they are coming. Um, that's the goal, they're on the list. So, it, but I am always up for helping talked with people. I mean, we, like I said, we have a lot of people who are chicken owners <laughs> or small farm owners in our community. So there's lots of awesome community fed information there. So, it, which is great, I think. So uh, that would definitely be helpful. And then her last question was, what kind of fertilizing do you do in the spring? So once again, I have a course coming up on that. I think it's in June. Um, let me just double check really quick. 
in the list that we're releasing, but I have like a, I think Natalie attended it. Um, there was one, yeah, I'm doing it. It's in June and it's really soon, but it's, I did a whole thing about fertilizing 101 and what I use and why I use it and everything, but I really focus on utilizing seaweed and fish emulsion uh, foliar feeds after the plants have gone out in the, and I use Neptune's organic specifically. The reason I use that is it's a really well-rounded uh, fertilizer because it has pretty equal parts of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And in the course, I break down how to understand those in a really simple, very beginner way. So you're not overwhelmed by it because it sounds super crazy to talk about chemical, like not chemicals, uh, minerals and all and nutrients like that. And what are those things? And when do I need to use what? And over fertilizing can feel like a bad word in the organic gardening world. But when you understand what you're putting in and how to do the inputs properly, it's not actually it's really good for the soil. So I go through all of that as well beginning in June, but there is an old replay of the course as well that I did and Natalie attended and she can vouch whether it, it was helpful or not, but um, I'm pretty sure Natalie attended it. So it, yeah, it's really helpful in terms of fertilizing because it's what I simplified what I learned when I was farming with a farm and how we did inputs and from a beyond organic farm, it was regenerative. So um, I really tried to simplify it in that way to make it approachable because it is really stressful to think about fertilizing. So anyways, thank you guys. Please look for the email I'm going to be sending out so that you guys can, you know, get your chance to jump in and see, but um, you, I'm just going to link really quick in the chat here to this herb garden course that's already accessible to you right now. Um, so you can just go ahead and jump in and check that out. It is not in our normal course format. Our course format actually has like a check system that you go through and it's like next lesson is really beautiful with more videos and everything with downloads it's pretty extensive um we just in our program couldn't use the normal course format for anything that was free so i did it a little differently but just so you can reference that but it's a really quick course you can do it in under 30 minutes so in an evening you can just sit down and do it so that was my goal and I wanted it to be accessible to as many people as possible so they can feel like they can confidently get into the garden this year. So at a low cost, <laughs> that, was from my, that was my goal. So I have loved seeing you guys. Thank you guys so much for attending today and make sure you sign up for the other workshops in that. Uh, actually, I'll link to it really quick as well. There is one every single month um, on different topics. So you can go ahead and check that out if you would like to and see if there's any other ones that kind of connect to you um, and they should align with what you would be going through in the garden in that season so thank you guys so much and please be in touch through email or instagram it's so good to see you guys and hear from you have a great day everyone